Hello, and welcome to the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance Lunch and Learn webinar for May 19th, 2021. Thank you for joining us this month. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Garrett Bullock, who will facilitate today's presentation. Dr. Bullock is a University of Oxford Clarendon Scholar who recently completed a DPhil in Clinical Epidemiology and Medical Statistics. He will begin his faculty position at the Wake Forest School of Medicine in July. Dr. Bullock is a physical therapist by training and is a member of the ORSI Sports Exercises Physical Activity Steering Committee, which collaborated with us on today's webinar. Welcome, Dr. Bullock. Thank you, and I'd like to introduce the two speakers today. Both of them are in clinic as we speak, um, so this will be a video. But um, so June Kennedy uh, has been working for Duke since 1985 and is a physical therapist and has her master's and doctoral degrees from University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. She is a board certified specialist in orthopedic physical therapy and has worked at Duke Sports Medicine for the last 20 years. She also enjoys being part of sports model of recovery and specifically focused on aging athlete and over um, shoulder and overhead athletes. Dr. Grant Garagus is a shoulder and elbow specialist in sports medicine at, of orthopedic surgery at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. He received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard, a research degree from MIT, and completed his orthopedic residency at Duke and his shoulder and elbow fellowship at the Rothman Institute. He was head of shoulder reconstruction and co-director of the Sports Medicine and Shoulder Surgery Fellowship at Duke for a decade before recruiting to Rush. And we'll begin Thank you there. for the opportunity to speak today on the topic of return to sport with glenohumeral osteoarthritis. My name is June Kennedy and I'm a physical therapist at Duke Sports Medicine Physical Therapy in Durham, North Carolina in the United States. My goals for this presentation are to describe physical therapy interventions that may help with management of shoulder arthritis in the non-operative setting, and to discuss return to sport considerations for individuals with shoulder arthritis. So considering who is this group of patients and who's at risk to develop glenohumeral osteoarthritis or just simply getting older as we age, there's increased risk especially if having a lifestyle of excessive loading, um, either with sport as in this Olympic weightlifting or a manual labor job, and having a prior joint injury such as dislocation or living with instability that's recurrent. And while there is no conclusive evidence in the literature to support the role of physical therapy to prevent shoulder arthritis, perhaps physical therapy can prevent progression and optimize function for those who live with this. In the red bar, you'll see uh, the statement by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, which is a panel of experts on this topic, who conclude that in the absence of reliable evidence, it's the opinion that physical therapy may benefit select patients with glenohumeral joint osteoarthritis. So prior to considering who these patients are, it's important to understand that perfect shoulder function requires a perfect alignment or as close as we can maintain of the center of rotation of the humeral head and the glenoid. And that optimizes the um, surface area to um, minimize the contact pressure. So in glenohumeral osteoarthritis, many joints wear um, evenly across the joint. And then there are some that wear selectively toward the back or posterior aspect of the glenoid, as you can see in these images, such that the humeral head actually can begin to slide to and sublux toward the back side of the joint. So who might develop that asymmetric wear and develop these abnormal contact pressures are those who have had prior stabilization surgery on the front side of the joint for dislocation. That's called capsular happy arthropathy, but basically it presents clinically as a contracture for external rotation. So they have a loss of external rotation range of motion. Those at risk also can include just being born with a glenoid that's a little shallow or tipped a little back in retroversion. And those with MDI, which stands for multi-directional instability, where the joint capsule is just loose and, and doesn't hold the humeral head up into the joint. 
And I see often in that population, often um, patients don't have well-developed scapular muscles and develop scapular winging. And we'll look at the impact of that on the mechanics. So an additional consideration uh, for those who've had instability procedures uh, may be that they also have altered bone morphology, such as uh, those with a ladder J procedure, where the coracoid was moved to the front of the shoulder to provide a bony block to the instability. And again, that changes the mechanics and often is associated with the contracted anterior joint capsule and tight and scarred subscapularis muscle. So folks who've had these anterior stabilization procedures are at risk up to 15 and 25% higher for developing osteoarthritis and that risk increases as with greater loss of external rotation. So finally that leads to what can we do as physical therapists. Um, in our model of impingement in the shoulder, which many are more familiar with, I find uh, the shoulder is often more tight on the back side of the joint and pushes the ball up to create this impingement. So we stretch the back side and also work on strengthening the rotator cuff muscles. In contrast, in osteoarthritis, the tightness is on the front side of the joint more so. And so we want to focus on stretching this external rotation um, with this type of exercise. And there's many types of ways to stretch, but this is an example. And also just optimizing mobility in all directions. And having had the good fortune to work with Dr. Garagoose for many years, I can channel him saying, spend five minutes a day of gentle stretching in all directions to optimize the joint mobility. The role of the rotator cuff in the osteoarthritis population is less clear. It's not usually weak or injured, but of course it's strong to good to have a strong rotator cuff for joint stability. So traditionally in therapy, people use bands and weights for rotator cuff strengthening, but that will increase compressive force of the humeral head into the joint. So, um, and combining that with rotation can be provocative to the joint with arthritis. So I would suggest if there is a need for rotator cuff strengthening, perhaps gentle isometric strengthening would be a better way to go. The role of the scapula is what I often focus on, particularly in this population with instability and multi-directional instability will often present with a large total arc of range of motion up at 90 degrees of abduction. So if I see that, I start suspecting, well, all this motion can happen at the ball and socket. So they don't really use their scapula very much. And so I will play this video. This is an example of what this can look like. If you give them a little load in their hands, it's a young man with posterior shoulder uh, degeneration. You see the scapular in prominent inferior angle and medial border. And um, if you don't see it here, you can increase the load with wall press test or prone plank testing and, and see how stable they can keep that scapula. So what happens to the glenohumeral joint during this winging? If you think three-dimensionally, as the inferior angle and medial border lift away from the rib cage, then there will be this compression of the posterior aspect of the joint and may contribute over time and repetition to the erosion that we see. So here's a gentleman who's four months post um, left anatomic total shoulder orthoplasty and he wants to get back to the gym. And you can see with simple biceps curls, he's getting this sort of scapula winging. This may um, make it challenging for that glenoid implant to bear up over time. So in contrast, if we simply have him rest his elbow on his thigh, then he can do the same weight, same exercise without that winging, and that may bear out better over time for him. Same guy wants to do his gym workout with chest flies, light bench pressing, and every time he brings his arm down and it goes beyond or posterior the frontal plane across his chest, he's getting pain and irritability on, on the front of his shoulder. So if he simply shortens that arc to try to keep the arms anterior, the frontal plane, then he can do the same exercise with the same weight and without the pain and hopefully over time enjoy um, the activity with less wear and strain to his joint. 
So another role we can play as therapists is teaching patients how to optimize and integrate their kinetic chain. And that means um, adding movement all the way from the trunk and hip and even the, the feet, um, developing core strength. And as some examples of that and common exercises for this population, for the freestyle stroke of swim, you'll notice that as that left arm is stroking forward uh, for the swimmer in this picture, her body is rolled to the side. And then as she would freestyle with the right arm, her body needs to torpedo roll in the water to the opposite direction. And that will optimize the alignment at the shoulder. Tiger Woods shows us down here in the golf swing that um, we need to optimize hip and trunk rotation in order to swing all the way through. And if that's stiff or not integrated well, then the extra motion and strength will have to come from the shoulder and will um, overtax that over time. And then our little skeleton progression for the overhead athlete shows the importance of being able to stand on one leg and have a well-aligned pelvis and trunk that then can rotate over the body to generate force, starting with the, the bottom leg all the way up and then rotating over. So some rehab strategies that we use, here's my guy again, he wants to return to golf. And so he's working on stability on the knee, the left knee that he's kneeling on, integrating trunk rotation. And then we kind of bring that into practicing his golf swing um, in a controlled environment to begin with into a sport net. And this is a, a patient I'm particularly proud of. She's had a left reverse total shoulder orthoplasty as a revision of a left anatomic that did not go well. And you'll notice that torpedo roll that she's demonstrating. Um, and she's very, very, very happy to be able to be back in the pool swimming. We also can um, help as physical therapists through the role of education. And again, channeling Dr. Garagus, telling patients to reverse childproof their house. So when you childproof, you move everything up and out of reach and instead bringing it down and within an arm's reach to make it easier on the shoulder. I mentioned gem do's and don'ts, including um, just keeping weights light, more reps in front of the body and not avoiding um, extreme uh, range of motion and long lever arms like the lateral deltoid raise. I think it's important for these patients to understand um, to balance rest with activity and not rake the whole yard for four hours, but break it into 30 minute segments. And then we offer just general counsel regarding the use of medicine and modalities um, for times of flare up. So to put all this together in a case, um, I'll demonstrate. Uh, this is a patient who was presented in his early 30s. Um, he played hockey in college and is continuing to play recreationally and has a history of anterior dislocation and rotator cuff tear that was managed with an anterior stabilization procedure called a bank art. So now he continues to feel some instability in his shoulder and neck pain. Uh, he actually thought his primary problem was a neck problem for upper trap pain. And imaging um, confirmed that he had a slight posterior subluxation, like I mentioned in the earlier slides, um, and a posterior labral degeneration. His total arc of motion on exam is very big. When his arm is brought to 90 degrees of abduction, he has 125 degrees of external rotation and 80 degrees of internal rotation, so a total arc of 205, which is very large. So I'm suspecting he's not going to be using his scapula much and um, in his activity uh, because he gets so much motion from the glenohumeral joint that he doesn't need his scapula. So I uh, give him some hand weights and test, and I don't see any smoking guns. This actually looks pretty good. Uh, you can see maybe if you're imagining a little overactivity in his upper trap that may be doing some subtle um, compensation, but not too terrible. So he increased the load uh, that he had with wall press testing, which also looked fine. But when putting him in prone to increase his load, you can begin to see that scapula medial border prominence. He's unable to control that well. And again, if you think of that tipping, that will be associated with that posterior labral compression and that's not gonna help his shoulder over time. And he's wielding a hockey stick at high speeds. So he needs to be able to control that. 
So he literally had three PT visits. And on the first one, we targeted uh, the scapular stabilizers with a good bit of challenge and with a what we call an open chain model or hands-free to strengthen his serratus anterior, which is a big uh, muscle for stabilizing that medial border. And then also the lower and middle trapezius muscles with very sharp arc uh, shoulder movement, but really focusing on the scapular stability. And then in his second visit, we added some functional training um, towards his sport using a body blade. And with the body blade, uh, you can simulate patterns of movement, but I'm just having him focus on holding that scapula in the right place. And he's even starting to feel, he's an athlete, so he gets it pretty quick, uh, how to stabilize that. And then we can, you, it's a really cool tool. You can integrate patterns of movement, lunging, you know, um, so it's a, it's a nice adjunct to have. And he actually bought one of these and worked on it. And for his third visit, we added, what can he do when he goes to the gym to simulate some of these things? And so he's doing that serratus anterior punch at a cable column while sitting on a gym ball to integrate some trunk stability. And as a skater, he's gonna need to push off on one foot and then the other foot and alternate that. So I just have him start practicing that in this uh, position and you can see his trunk increase, trunk activity increase. And uh, he felt like from here, those were good tools and his, his upper trapezius symptoms that he had presented with resolved. He felt less pain and more stable. And uh, his wife was my babysitter for years. So I was able to keep up with him. And as far as I know, he's still playing hockey. Uh, so this just shows the body blade is a good tool for generating uh, good levels of force in the scapular stabilizers. And so in summary, um, the tools in our toolbox as physical therapists to try uh, and help this population with shoulder arthritis is to restore and maintain range of motion with a bias towards external rotation, providing a stable scapular base, integrating the kinetic chain, providing education about what to do and what not to do. And uh, this is my email. If you have any questions about this, I'd be happy to, to hear from you. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, June Kennedy. Thank you, Garrett Bullock. Thanks to the whole group for including me on this uh, fantastic panel. This is really a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, I've had the opportunity when I was at Duke for almost 10 years to work with June and, and co-treat a lot of patients uh, with non-operative and operative uh, measures for arthritis and really get a lot of people back to sports. So um, a, a lot of patients come in and they ask about what can I do? What can I not do? What will I be able to do with or without surgery? And so these are very relevant questions for me as a, as a shoulder specialist, a shoulder surgeon, uh, when I'm with patients uh, counseling them. So uh, after I left Duke, I, I moved to Chicago. I now work at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. You can see all my uh, contact info there and feel free to follow me on social media. I love uh, kind of conversing with the wider audience about, about shoulder issues and shoulder arthritis. So Without further ado, we'll dive right in. Um, there's a lot of data here. Um, I'll try to keep it interesting and lively and, uh, and we'll get through this. This will be great. So I'm a consultant for a couple companies that make implants. I don't think that's anything relevant to this. Some special thank yous, first of all, to Garrett Bullock for including me in this endeavor. Um, here's Garrett, you know, anyone who knows Garrett knows he's very international uh, and very uh, put together guy. You may not know that I, I got to know Garrett because uh, I was working late one night and I was walking through our clinic and I found his wallet and uh, he had dropped his wallet <laughs> while he was working in a nearby uh, lab. And obviously I, I figured out who it was. I got the wallet back to him and that was probably the most fortuitous thing that ever happened to me. I mean, he would have lost his wallet, but for me, 
it created a, a just a, a fantastic uh, professional and personal a friendship and relationship that continues to the present day. You may not know that Garrett was actually uh, has some uh, expertise in shoulders as well. So he's actually a highly regarded pitcher. That's a picture of Garrett. I think they're running against Miami, um, University of Miami. And um, so left-hand pitcher at Garrett Bullock. So he knows a thing or two about shoulders. And then obviously June Kennedy, you just saw June speak. You know that she's a dynamic uh, educator. She's really known for teaching the residents and fellows and then also the patients love her. So it was a real pleasure to work with June and it's nice to be able to reunite for this. Lastly, Chris Hagen, he's our current research uh, coordinator here at, uh, at Rush. Uh, and he, uh, he really did a lot to get this talk off the ground and I hats off to, to Chris. All right, so agenda today, we'll just keep it very simple. We'll talk about surgeon recommendations. There's a couple studies that look at um, basically surveys of surgeons and what surgeons recommend their patients do and do not do after shoulder arthroplasty and specifically different types of arthroplasty. The three types we'll talk about are what's called a humeral head hemiarthroplasty. That's when just the humeral side is replaced. That is the most robust type of arthroplasty um, because the humerus typically does not get loose and it's the metal components. An anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty that adds in a plastic glenoid component that plastic glenoid component is a little piece of plastic. It can get loose over time, so a little bit more, um, a little less robust, if you will. And the last is the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, where the ball and socket are reversed. This is um, a great implant for people that have rotator cuff tears or glenoid problems. It can accommodate a larger spectrum of pathology, but it's a more complicated implant. It's also a more recently introduced implant, so it was only FDA approved in the early 2000s. So, you know, as the surgeon community has been warming up to this implant and kind of understanding that um, maybe it's not as finicky or fragile as we originally thought, um, people have slowly become more comfortable with their recommendations. We'll also talk about what patients uh, do. So we know what the surgeons tell the patients, but what do the patients actually do with regard to sports? And then we'll go over some comparative studies, some meta-analysis on this topic. So Surgeon recommendations. So the first study I want to show, this is from 2012. So keep in mind that FDA approval of different reverse designs in the U.S. was, there was some limited stuff, 2005 or so, somewhere in there, some, some as early as 2003, but basically, you know, relatively new implant at this point. And so keep that in mind as we go forward. I've broken it up here. There's a lot of data in this paper and I've tried to distill it as much as possible. Basically, they surveyed surgeons said, hey, if you have someone with a hemiarthroplasty, that's the one with just the ball side, the most robust, if you will, anatomic total shoulder, that's ATSA, or reverse total shoulder, are you gonna allow them to go back to these sports? And they had a huge list of sports, everything you can possibly imagine. Many sports I'd never even heard of, but I'll tell you, the bottom line is the trend is consistent that with the hemiarthroplasty, surgeons were always more com most comfortable with patients going back to sport with a hemiarthroplasty. Again, it doesn't have that glenoid socket. It doesn't have that reverse ball and socket architecture. It's the most robust implant. And you might wonder, well, if that's true, why don't we use a hemi every time? Well, the problem is it also has the highest rate of residual pain. The metal ball can wear away the unresurfaced bony socket and lead to pain revision down the road. So this jives with what I have seen in my experience. You know, we use the hemi for our very, very active patients our farmers, our military patients, our folks that want to remain very active with, with heavy, heavy, heavy weightlifting, contact sports, et cetera. So you can see for sports where a fall might buy, be a possibility, not as much difference between the two, hemi and anatomic. That's because the stem is the, is the concern. If you have a periprosthetic fracture, that's a big deal. Reverse, certainly fewer people allowing that um, because there's an instability uh, risk with the reverse that's higher than the other two and people worry about that happening. With these low load sports, this kind of fascinates me. You know, reverse total shoulder is the most common shoulder arthroplasty used worldwide for patients over the age of, uh, of, of 70 at this point. And you wonder if, I mean, if, if you told people they couldn't golf or swim or play tennis, you, you never have a patient that would sign up for it. So I don't exactly know, you know, I think these numbers may have changed since 2012 in the last, you know, nine years. The big concern here is the contact sports. I mean, thankfully that's a small percentage of our patients, but you know, certainly if you have somebody who wants to engage in, in hockey, like June's patient, et cetera, um, if they're really gonna be checking and, and doing ballistic type sports, you may worry that that plastic socket will get used or get loose. And you may be obviously concerned about doing something a little more fragile like the reverse total shoulder. 
What about an international perspective? So this study was done around the same time. This is actually a study out of Duke. Um, and they took 101 patients or 101 surgeons. Some were from the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons and also the SESEC, which is the European Shoulder and Elbow Society. And the bottom line is you've got uh, essentially very similar numbers. Uh, key things here are the return to sport time was just after six months, which makes sense. Typically, you know, in my practice, six months is when I tell the patients, okay, if you want to get back to golf and tennis, you know, start doing that now. They also talked about, um, uh, you know, what we're allowed over time. So, you know, a lot of these patients, a lot of them kind of, uh, the, because there was a European uh, contingent in the study, a higher percentage of, of surgeons allowing uh, European patients to do some of these things because I think they were a little more comfortable with the implant. It was available in Europe about 10 years before it was available in the US. This is a busy uh, slide here, but what you can see here is with the hemiarthroplasty, the total anatomic total shoulder, and the reverse total shoulder, each of these columns, the sports range from the least intense on the shoulder over here, kind of up to the most intense on the shoulder um, from lowest to highest. And you can kind of see that trend as you move across the chart where basically, um, uh, you know, in general, people are more comfortable with all sports with a hemiarthroplasty than the total, than the reverse in a stepwise fashion. And certainly for those highest, most intense sports, um, you know, with, with a reverse, you're definitely not, uh, surgeons are not going to be comfortable with that, whereas a hemi, they might be. All right. So that's kind of the trend over time. Obviously, these are individual surveys. They're based on individual surgeons practice patterns and I'm not showing you data whether this <laughs> makes sense or doesn't but this is based on the surgeon's comfort level. All right that's what the surgeons recommend both American surgeons and, and uh, European surgeons. What do patients actually do? So the bottom line here is that um, uh, you know high percent 67 uh, percent of patients who played sports before the surgery return to sports after the procedure and uh, and that is totally uh, consistent. I, I would say, in my experience, it might even be a little bit higher, um, but I, I think most of these patients, if they play a sport before with their arthritic shoulder, you know, you would hope that when their range of motion improves and their pain improves, that they would be able to, to return back. Now, some are not comfortable, even though they feel like they could do it, they may not want to return because they think, you know, hey, my sport, my, my, my shoulder wore out playing this sport for years. I just went through this surgery and recovery you know, I got to hang it up sometime. Maybe I'm not going to play the sport by choice. So there's there's that factor as well. Again, you can see here the average return to sport was about six and a half months with jives with the surgeon's recommendations. I think the surgeons are probably dictating that return to sport time frame because they tell them at six months, hey, go ahead and go back. Patients do go do seem to comply with that. And then um, you can see the sports they're going back to. Some are going back to high demand sports, low demand sports. I think this has little to do with the arthroplasty and more to do with the patient population. I mean, this is typical. This is a patient population in there. Um, well, you can see the mean age in the study, 21, which is very young for an arthroplasty, up to 97 years old. So, you know, large range. Um, the mean age, though, 60s. That's typical for shoulder arthritis. It typically hits people a little younger than hip and knee arthritis. So it's patients kind of in their mid 60s for osteoarthritis of the shoulder. Obviously, cuff tear arthropathy skews a little bit older more in the late 60s and early 70s. So again, patients are going back to sports um, at, a, at a high degree of probability. All right, what about, this is two studies I've kind of combined in one chart, um, a lot here again, but just to kind of, the bottom line here is that if the patients weren't doing sports before their arthroplasty, maybe they hung it up because of health issues or maybe their shoulder, or maybe they just, you know, for whatever reason, moved away from uh, sporting activities, they're not likely to go back to sports after shoulder arthroplasty if they hadn't played any sports within the five years prior. And that just makes sense. I mean, there's so much that goes into a decision to, to get out on the, uh, on the pitch. Um, and then you can look here that, uh, so in this study, all the patients who played sports before surgery went back. And again, these are, some of these patients are young, some are quite elderly, but if they're playing sports, no matter their age, young, middle-aged, old, they're going back. Same thing here, 89% returned. So these patients are going back. So I think the thing for your patients to tell them is, you know, are you going to be better than you were before? Are you going to be able to dunk a basketball if you couldn't before and, and all this thing? Probably not. But if you were playing before surgery, you're very likely with a high degree of probability, 89%, 97% to go back to playing. Uh, and I can tell you anecdotally from my own patient experience, um, 
they, they do better. Again, the pain and function is better, certainly for those lower demand sports, things like golf and tennis. I mean, a lot of my patients come to me because I do a shoulder replacement. Now, now the, the guy or girl who had their shoulder done is now beating their friends on the golf course because they've shaved a couple strokes off and their friends then come to me because they think, uh, oh, it must be because of the shoulder replacement. So I think for certainly for those kind of sports, it can be helpful. If your patient's engaged in, you know, boxing or tackle football or hockey, those are the ones where you're having a real counseling conversation about maybe you're not a good candidate for an anatomic or reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, you might run a higher risk of getting it loose prematurely. Um, I'll skip this one in the interest of time. So there's some comparative studies too, some meta-analysis of these. So here's one uh, where they looked at reverse total shoulder versus hemiarthroplasty. Um, this study has some, um, raises some questions in my mind because if you look at hemiarthroplasty, the average age was uh, 71. I have not done a hemiarthroplasty in a 71 year old patient uh, for osteoarthritis, I think ever in, in, my, in my career because typically those patients are not engaged in those boxing, CrossFit, mixed martial arts, American football kind of sports where I would not want the patient going back to anatomic or reverse. And as I mentioned, the HEMI has a higher rate of pain. So it's hard to imagine, you know, basically why these patients were indicated for that procedure and how they were able to find 71 patients in that group. But be that as it may, they had these two groups that were otherwise comparable. This is the only study that showed a higher rate of return to sport with reverse than the HEMI. Again, I question the study uh, significantly because I'm not really sure who these patients were and why they did a HEMI in the first place. Maybe they were, um, you know, someone's will do a HEMI in an elderly patient if they use their arms for weight bearing. So someone that's wheelchair bound or uses a walker and obviously return to sport is gonna be very affected by, by those sorts of issues. So you'll see the study in the literature, but I, I would take it with a big grain of salt. Here's a systematic review, 90% uh, return to sport for anatomic total shoulder compared to 77% for reverse total shoulder. And you said 77%, this is higher than some of the numbers you showed earlier. Well, the reason is this, this review was done in 2020. So I was showing you the surveys from 2011 and 2012. So because this, this implant was only FDA approved in the only two, early 2000s, we really progressed a lot in terms of our comfort level as we see the patients are doing these things and they're doing well. So the things that you would, you know, patients say, well, what kind of sports can I do and not do? And I tell them, listen, take your average active person in their early to mid 60s and all that stuff's fine. So swimming, golf, gym, yoga, absolutely. Even free weights, absolutely. If you're bodybuilding, mixed martial arts, um, CrossFit, you know, my personally, if I was in one of these survey studies, those are the things where I say, listen, you know, this implant is a metal and plastic bearing unless it's a hemiarthroplasty. And the load and the wear on that, or the wear on that implant is a function of the load you apply across it and the numbers of number of cycles. So if you're doing more of the strenuous activities, if you're doing more of the, that could cause wear debris, if you're doing more of these ballistic activities, like again, like boxing or mixed martial arts that could jar things loose, obviously that's where the concern is. Ultimately the patients, as we've seen from the studies are gonna do what they're gonna do. You know, some of these guys come in, they're bodybuilders, they want their whole shoulder done just so they can just so they can put up 400 pounds on the bench press one more time, doc. I just want to do it one more time. And you know, that's their prerogative. So my, my job is to counsel them and tell them that's maybe not the best idea. So, okay, here's one on anatomic total shoulder versus hemiarthroplasty. Bottom line, no difference in the re, uh, rate to return to sport. Um, but you know, again, the, the, the sport activity level was, was a little bit different. So, you know, again, I think for our hemiarthroplasty, we consider that more for our very, very active patients where we think the plastic glenoid is not going to last because of the level of sport they're participating in. Here's another one. Uh, this one is by the same authors that had that reverse total shoulder study showing higher rate of return to sport with reverse total. And so not surprisingly, their, their, uh, their systematic review kind of showed the same findings. So just to summarize this all, anatomic total shoulder has the highest rate of return to sport across all the majority of all the uh, literature, including the systematic reviews. So, and that makes sense. It has the most normal kinematics. Um, the patients have, get the greatest range of motion. It has the lowest complication rate. It is the gold standard. The reverse total shoulder has become more popular. 
but the anatomic total shoulder is the gold standard. The return to sport takes just over six months. I think this is surgeon driven. The surgeons tell the patients at six months, you can go back to sports and then they go back to sports uh, soon after. There is a wide variability in surgeon recommendations. Very interesting, those first two studies I showed you, the American surgeons were a little more restrictive. They had had the implant for 10 to 15 years less than the European counterparts. And over time, if you look at the later studies, um, we think that surgeons are becoming a little more uh, cavalier with who, with what they allow with regard to the implants as the patients are doing these things on their own and then showing us that they're doing well and not having a high complication rate. So that has changed both internationally and over time, given the more widespread adoption and the more the higher comfort level with this implant. And the last thing is, no matter what the surgeons tell the patients to do, the patients are gonna do what they wanna do. They're participating in sports with a high degree of frequency at a high level, and they're very satisfied. They're getting back and they're happy and they're not having a high complication rate as you would fear. So the surgeons may be a little more, uh, say, uh, nervous than the patients, but the patients are proving that these implants work quite well. So these are my references. I wanna thank everybody for their attention. Please feel free to follow me on social media and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this group. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real honor, thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is uh, from Nicholas. Can you give me more detail on your clinical experience for performing more isometric work on shoulder OA patients compared to isotonics? And this one's definitely for June. <laughs> Hi guys, thanks Garrett. It's, uh, it's an honor to be with you all today and, um, and participate in this discussion. So thank you. For, um, for allowing me to take part. I'll start my video too in case, there we go, I can show up. Uh, yeah, so I think that um, in particular in the non-operative setting for an arthritic shoulder, uh, my bias, and this is not really based on data, but just in thinking about the shoulder joint would be to go with more isometric strengthening uh, of the rotator cuff, and the reason is, uh, and that would, could be just with simple, you know, pushing into the wall, pushing into their hand or holding a band and stepping sideways and to, to kind of um, remain the same position. So if the rotator cuff compresses the humeral head into the glenoid and you have an arthritic joint with, with poor cartilage there, and then you add rotation, um, to have that done uh, with resistance can be provocative. But if the cuff is weak and you want it to center the head well, it seems isometric can be um, advantageous over isotonic. And you can do it in different positions. Uh, after orthoplasty, uh, we initiate isometric strengthening of the deltoid and scapular muscles uh, post-op day one uh, for the reverse patients because there's really no soft tissue repair around that for the majority of the patients. After anatomic total shoulder orthoplasty, uh, we will not do any strength loading across uh, the subscap because if that has active tension across it, it can disrupt the healing process and then it's not um, as good of a repair. It's not as the functionality of the prosthetic implant uh, is compromised. All right, so we have time for Really, one more question. I'll go with Neil Evans. I think this, this is actually one of my questions. Based on your experiences, is there a certain location of the humeral head where you see the more OA? For example, I'm assuming maybe the posterior aspect of the humeral head based on scapular winging compared to the anterior. Uh, so I would feel that one to Grant if he were here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll do my best. Um, I know, um, you know, posterior glenoid erosion is the uh, is the more characteristic pattern of erosion on the glenoid side for the humeral head side if it's post trauma from like dislocation with a hill sacs lesion that's often on the posterior aspect of the uh, humeral head but i think that uh, grant and uh, some of the researchers here at duke had studied 
load patterns on the humeral head through like bench pressing and push-ups and found that there was more compressive force on the anterior aspect of the humeral head. But I think the wear pattern can, can certainly be different depending on, it can be concentric like right in the middle or it can be shifted uh, more anterior or posterior depending on, on the driving um, reason for the arthritic degeneration. I will go with uh, one more. Um, you mentioned a bias towards stretching ER. What are your thoughts on stretching ER versus loading into ER, i.e. eccentric IR control to potentially get the benefits of force production through range? That, uh, so that was a long question. Uh, so the bias to stretch external rotation is because in a non-operative arthritic shoulder joint, there's almost always an internal rotation contracture. The anterior aspect of the joint is very tight uh, along with the subscap tendon often. And so you wanna stretch that out so that the humeral head can, can uh, be centered better. In the post-operative setting, if there's an anatomic total shoulder orthoplasty, they almost always go through the subscapularis tendon to be able to visualize and get into the joint. And then that's repaired. And so in that setting, you don't stretch external rotation basically ever. I mean, we limit it to around 30 degrees for the first six weeks and then gently let the motion come back um, as, as tolerated, um, but never really forcefully stretching that. I think, yeah, I, think, I think that's about all the time we have for today. Um, I want to thank everyone again for coming and then for OA Action Alliance for hosting this again. And this is a support exercise, physical activity, or C um, group in, in collaboration as well. And I think that's it. Garrett, thank you so much for uh, facilitating today's presentation in June. So glad you could join us. Thank you for your time and putting together this um, presentation. And thanks to everyone for joining us. That does conclude today's presentation. We hope you can join us uh, for the Lunch and Learn on June 16th, which will feature Sandra Soto, PhD and PH, who will present qualitative dyadic interviews with Latinas with OA and a supporter of their physical activity.